So we're here to talk about flow funding. I say flow because I like that term, free, libre, open. We are not specifically about program code. It's anything that is free, libre, open. I'll say more about that. Uh, it meets the same sort of qualifications in terms of freedoms and creativity and the economics. So that's what we're talking about today. Uh, I am co-founder of snowdrift.coop, which is one of various efforts that people have done to deal with these issues. Uh, but we're just going to talk about what the issues are and not so much about the status of Snowdrift, which you could watch my talk from last year about what's going on. Not much update since then. Flow software specifically is public goods. And what is public goods? We'll get into that. There's the difference between goods and services. We're not talking about just good, bad. We're talking about goods and services. And goods provide some utility whenever you want it. After the good exists, we can exchange it and do all these things and whatever. This is a different thing than services, which, whoops, services, which provide utility at the time that you are actually generating them. You are here in this room listening to me and the, I'm giving a service of presenting this talk. And then there will be a video recording, hopefully. And that's more like a good, anybody can watch the video anytime. And so these are different economic activities that are connected. So when we're talking about goods, which is how we mostly think about program code, I like to think about the traits rather than types. It's just a less limited box way of thinking. Uh, and traditionally in economics, they talk about rivalrousness, which sounds really jargony. And so let's just drop that. And same thing with excludability, which sounds kind of wordy too. Uh, we're really talking about whether something is scarce or abundant when we're talking about rivalry, whatever. This is an easier way to think about it. If something is abundant, it just means there's enough of it for it to go around. Doesn't matter if it's infinite or there's just more than we need. If it's scarce, then there's some sort of a competition. If you take it, then I, there's less for others. And so excludability is really more about whether it is exclusive. So yes, there are ways to lock down software or lock down things and not block them from people by making it excludable, by making that emphasis. The idea economically is if you can make it exclusive, you should. And let's not have that default. The question really is just, is it exclusive or not? And really the opposite of that would be open. So we have some more accessible language to talk about the economic issues. Is something scarce or abundant? Or is it open or closed or open or exclusive? And so in this basic grid, we have the idea that private goods are how our economy is based. We have scarcity. So if you use something, it use, gets used up or it's not available for somebody else at that time. If it's exclusive, then we can't be sharing it all at once. And those, all of our economics is some the stuff in all the field of economics is almost always so focused on that. And that is obviously not what we're dealing with when we're talking about flow software or flow creative work of any sort. We are talking about open and abundant and that's public goods. And there are a couple other categories you can be aware of. So if you had scarce, but it's open, well, that's called commons or common goods. And that actually has some distinct economic qualities. So for uh, the forest, if you can't block anybody from going in and just cutting down the trees or fishing or whatever else, or for that matter, uh, using space in a public park, at some level, there's a, oh, maybe this is limited and you could actually use it up and then it would leave less for others, but you can't block anybody from doing that. So that has its own set of dilemmas. And if you have abundant but exclusive, we call that club goods, and that's proprietary software for the most part. There is no reason we couldn't all be using this software and sharing it openly and every, yeah, but you have to pay or you have to watch these ads or whatever the limitations are in order to get access to this special club where you get to use the software. And so that has its own set of economic characteristics and so public goods, this uh, open and abundant, has the qualities that free software has, and that has a totally different set of economics to private goods, which is what most people think of when they think about how the economic system should work. So what do we do with this information? We can start seeing it all around in the world. Please keep this mental model in mind. It will make so much sense as you start exploring, like a bike path is basically a public good. Once it exists, everybody can use it. It doesn't really matter how many bikes there are because it's very, very rare for it to totally fill up a bike path That's that you can easily fit lots of bikes together. And a road for cars, well, that's a public good, kind of. But, like, you can fill it up with cars because cars take up a lot of space. You can have noise and pollution when you have more cars. 
more cars are heavy and they wear it down, whereas in the bike path, basically it's just wear and tear that just happens with weather no matter what. So there's more of a public good status, more open, more abundant. We could talk about this in terms of looking at anything in the world. Is this something that's scarce or abundant? Is this something that's open or exclusive? And you can start exploring the world seeing it this way. We can think of the actual details of something. So is access something that's exclusive or is use? Do we have all these freedoms? If you are able to change something, is it something where only in practice a few people have the resources or the possibility to change it? Then that's scarce or exclusive in certain ways. Whereas if we all share these freedoms, so it's not an absolute black and white thing, but the main features you can start seeing everywhere. And so we can talk about how great public goods are. They maximize the social benefit. Everybody gets the results. We can synthesize and evolve. We can all get all the benefits. We can avoid all of these perverse incentives that happen when you try to make sure that things are exclusive and you force all sorts of things into people, costs and ads and other problems. Well, in this system where everything is open to everyone, there is no basis for profit at all. I would be happy to have an argument with anybody who wants to discuss this question, but I really think that every attempt to say that somehow you're going to get a return on investing in public goods, it just, there's no place for an investor to say, I put in my extra time or I put in all this extra money and therefore I'm going to somehow get something. No, because the whole point is it's open to everyone. And once it's there, everyone gets all the benefits. So we have a problem with free riding where if everyone free rides, nobody's putting in any of the work to make it happen in the first place or to maintain it. But we don't want to get rid of free riding. The whole point is that we want it to be everybody can use this. We don't want to impose some sort of cost. So we have this trouble. Who's going to do the work of supporting this? How can we spread the burden and have everybody chip in? This is a coordination problem. So that's the basic overview of the economics of public goods and free software. And my goal today is to help everybody have a very clear and accessible language for how to think about this, how to talk about this, so that we avoid all of the pitfalls in making sense of what is the dilemma we face. Today in public goods, we have potentially services can be profitable. You can have a thing where people pay more for the service than the absolute cost of just delivering it. And so you can have custom development, which is a service, again, not a good. You could have support. Uh, you could have hosting for software. And when people pay for those things, if they're paying more than the cost in some way, there's some profit, that profit could go back into the work of making the public good better for everyone. Of course, we have taxes. That is actually the way we have most public goods in the world. If we just make everybody chip in, that solves the coordination problem. It also has all sorts of dilemmas and problems, and I'm not going to get into the debates about the good and bad and troubles. I don't think that a absolute no tax or an absolute, you know, every taxes are the solution to everything is the answer. Uh, but we're not going to hear talk about that. But it is a solution and we can recognize that it solves the coordination problem. So if we're not going to focus on taxes, and honestly, uh, if I could uh, create a tax regime that would fund all of free software, uh, maybe we'd be talking about that. But I don't even see a path to doing that right now. <laughs> so we're left with donations. We have business leagues that do work together. We had a great talk from Kara in this morning talking about a lot about how companies can contribute to free software and whether they are or not and how to get that to happen. That is a coordination problem in its, uh, itself, but hey, those companies are very well organized. So they uh, can more easily coordinate and there's smaller numbers of entities and maybe they can, somebody in an organization can make a decision, have control over a big pot of money and some of it can go to free software. Uh, that is its own challenges. That's still not going to align the incentives with the public benefit because if it's just companies doing it, they're doing it for their business interests. And if we want public goods that are for the public interest, then it really helps if the economics are supported by the public themselves, which means general public donating to support the public goods we all enjoy. How can we organize and actually work together because this is not something that individually we solve. This is a collective action, social problem. We can all benefit from public goods. We all need to somehow work together to support them. And that is the dilemma we face. So I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Michael, who's going to talk about some ideas that we've been talking about over years and things that he's been having ideas on recently. 
about answering this question and prompting people to think, how do we organize our actions together? Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, so um, I'm Michael. I'm an interaction designer and user researcher with a background in psychology. Been uh, volunteering with Snowdrift for quite a few years and uh, very interested in this problem and also just in general in applying sort of psychological insights and so, in, insights about how people interact socially to technology designed to make things better for all of us. So carrying on from where Aaron left off, this is the question we're trying to trying to find solutions to. How can we organize individuals to be able to act collectively to fund public goods so we can all have a, have a world with lots of public goods that aren't encumbered by all these artificial restrictions? So just to clarify, in general, we're, what we're talking about is donations from the general public, crowdfunding type scenarios. So here's, here's kind of my take on the status quo, that um, you have a bunch of projects who are just you know, they're kind of getting along, they're producing some good things, some software that people appreciate and find useful, but they don't have a lot of funding, they're working in their spare time in general, and maybe some of them are kind of happy with that, but plenty of them, as uh, I thought earlier today, both of us are thinking something like this, you know, our project could do so much more if only more people would help fund it. Like, if I could be paid to do this, I would much prefer to do it. Not everybody would do it, but a lot of people would. Um, so the, the common to buy us a coffee, to me, kind of is a sign that the crowdfunding isn't really working too well because it's not, it's really just, it's not a very big ambition to say like, well, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, it would be really nice if you buy me a coffee. You know, I'll appreciate that. You'll be expressing your thanks. That, that's great. But nothing's going to fundamentally change from that, right? Let's say, let's say I'm working on Inkscape and what if, I, what if I said, well, what if Inkscape actually could outcompete compete Adobe Illustrator? Right? Take, take your whatever your craft software that you're particularly a fan of. Just think of, think of what if that became so good, so well supported, so well designed that just the proprietary options couldn't really compete anymore. Even, you know, even if they reduced their price to zero and to, didn't impose ads and stuff like that. So why is there this problem that it's hard to get more people to help fund it? So I think this is kind of the most intuitive, the thing people kind of jump to and imagine is the problem, that there are a whole bunch of people who are using it who could afford to fund it, but they just kind of think, why donate when I don't have to? Basically, like, kind of they're, they don't have much community spirit. They're kind of, you know, selfish or whatever. But But generally that they're, that this is the problem. Uh, we think that this is not really the key problem. Of course, there's some people who, who have this sort of attitude, but we think what's much more the underlying problem is that there are a lot of people who would actually feel good about donating, would be motivated to no donate, if they felt that it was really gonna make a difference and that they weren't just sort of putting their, their small amount of money they can afford into a kind of giant pot where it's gonna sort of disappear and nothing's going to change, right? Inkscape is still not going to be used by most people, designers and stuff. They're all going to still be using Adobe Illustrator. So I could donate, but what I can afford wouldn't make much difference. If that's really the key problem, then how do we coordinate people so that what they can do does feel like it makes a difference and doesn't just feel like it makes a difference, it really does make a difference. So I'm first going to talk about three specific approaches to this to give you sort of concrete examples to think about. And then I'm going to break it down into looking at what are the variables? What are all the decisions you have to make to, to come up with and decide on and launch an approach to donor coordination? So first of all, there's snowdrift.coop, which, as I mentioned, I've been, been volunteering with for quite a few years. And what I'm representing here is the, the, the basically the original version of donor coordination that Snowdrift came up with. So, and it's it's on the site now, it's marked as alpha, but you can actually go pledge, um, like I'm a, I'm a patron there. We've got like over 150, 165, yeah, something like that. I got my mom to pledge to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but some 
basically the idea here is you say, okay, I'll pledge to donate a tenth of a cent per month for every other person who joins and does the same as me. Okay? So you've got ten people who agree to do that and now you're donating one cent a month, right? But these numbers go up quadratically. So if you get to like ten thousand people, you're talking about a fair amount of money. So some things to note about this particular example. There's no explicit goal stated. It's just like, we need more funding. Uh, please join our crowd so we can have more funding. Right? There's continuous matching, meaning that every single time a single more person joins the crowd, it affects what everybody else donates. So it's, it's, there's no, no sort of waiting for some threshold. <coughs> and the way the matching or the coordination is done is based on the size of the crowd. So there's no, there's no kind of, it doesn't matter how much each person's willing to donate. They just count as one person. In fact, there's no options for them to donate different amounts. It's a tenth of a cent per month. So crowdmatch.org is a prototype site. Um, I actually had a, a sort of furlough from work at, early in this year and got a chance to do some work on this. And this is a, a different approach, um, which you know, crowd matching, the word crowd matching could also be used for what Snowdrift, well, what is just described. But this is a prototype with a, quite a different approach. So you see the cartoon here. The idea is that someone in the crowd thinks to say, hey, how much do you actually need? Like, rather than just thinking like, well, I can't make a difference. Somebody thinks, well, I'm curious how much, how much would make a difference. So the, the, the team says, well, we're all volunteers. Um, even one pay, paid part-timer would help a lot, right? But another person says a small full-time team would be game-changing, right? We could go from being, and this is, this is kind of based on the Snowdrift example it, it itself, right? We have no, currently have no, no paid anybody. And if we had a small full-time team, we could do things, you know, like what we would dream of doing for, for us for the past year. And somebody says that would cost about $36,000 a month. So the point here, this is there's one big goal. It's th this model is starting with a vision of what's going to change the game. How much money do you need for that? Um, and then somebody says, "I'll help fund it to the extent others join me." So this phrase "to the extent" is very important here because it's it's a continuous matching. It's like saying, um, "I'll if if others join me a bit, I'll fund it a bit. If others join me a lot, I'll fund it a lot." Um, with this model, you could have a variable or a fixed cost. So like I could say, I'll, I'll be happy to contribute $5 a month once collectively together we're meeting this $36,000 a month goal. Until we get there, I'm only going to contribute part of that um, because I want more people to be contributing in. So then the third example, um, I will if we can, org. This idea occurred to me more recently. And when I was just, I was thinking, what's the absolute simplest way this could be implemented that would sort of take the minimum resources to get it off the ground? So I came up with this, which I then started to feel like wasn't, was not only simpler to implement, but had some advantages too. So it's kind of similar to the crowdmatch.org, but has some crucial differences. So you see, again, somebody says, how much would make a real difference? Slightly different question. They ask what would make a real difference, not like how much do you need for your sort of ultimate goal to make. And the questions here are reversed. A small, a small full-time team of employees would be game-changing. Right? Somebody thinks about what would change the game. Somebody else says, yeah, but even one paid part-timer would make a big difference. So they're thinking of an incremental goal. Like what's, what's something that could really make a substantial difference from where we are now, but is still maybe very far from where we want to be ultimately. That would cost about such and such a month. So you know, let's say this could be like $500 a month or something. It could be something just was like nobody got paid yet. It was just it would cover hosting fees. It would cover maybe some legal advice, things like that. Now here, somebody says, I'll help fund it if, if together we can reach that goal. Who's in? And somebody else else says, I'm in. And another person says, me too. The key thing here is versus, in the, in the crowd matching example, it was to the extent. That's continuous matching. 
Here it's if together we can reach their goal. It's an all or none threshold. So they're basically saying, okay, we've got a smallish goal and we're gonna say, nobody's gonna start giving anything until together we can um, meet that goal, right? So it's very simple in that, in that respect. Here again, you could have a variable or a fixed pledge. So you could say, you could, you could say, okay, everybody to join the crowd, you have to pledge $5 a month. Um, or you could, you could say you can pledge whatever you like and you're just going to give, not give it until, until we meet the goal. So let's look, break this down in terms of the un underlying variables here. Because one of the, the, the reason for, from my point of view, for wanting to give this talk is that we've found that trying to get to consensus on all these different variables of how to do it has been one of the things that made it challenging to get make progress. Because like, you know, I have one one particular idea, other people have other ideas and people, you know, um, have really kind of compelling reasons to argue for different approaches that you can't, that are incompatible, right? So first, there's the co basis of the coordination. Two, two ways you can do this. One, you can do it on how much the crowd pledges. So how, how many dollars or whatever currency you're working in that they have pledged, or you can do it by, by crowd size. So the second of the two examples I showed you were both based on crowd pledge. The, the original Snowdrift one is based on crowd size. So what are the pros and cons of those two things? It would be a question. Then the goal or whether you have a goal at all. So the, the original Snowdrift version, as I mentioned, there's no specific goal, meant, goal stated. It's just like, we definitely don't have enough money to thrive. We need more, please join our crowd. So just more, more monthly funding will help. Or do you give an incremental goal, like, like with the I will if we can example, you say, we have the specific goal, but it's not like our ultimate goal. It's just like we know from where we are right now, this would make a, a meaningful difference. Um, and then finally, you can have a big goal, like in the crowdmatch.org example. This is what we think would allow our project to, to really thrive. And that could, be, that could be a huge goal. It could be something that was totally, like it seemed completely pie in the sky. But like in the, in the example, say, of Inkscape wanting to outcompete Adobe Illustrator, for example. <clears throat> so then there's the coordination function. And this is probably the most, most complicated uh, one because there are lots of different ways to approach it. But firstly, you have the very simple version where it's just how much each person donates. I don't know if this is too small to read at the back, but the, this says each person donates. This is crowd pledge or crowd size, whatever your uh, coordination basis is. This one says project receives. So when you make what each person donates just directly proportional to whatever your coordination basis is, crowd pledge or crowd size, then that's pretty simple. And then that works out quadratically in terms of, so like, for example, let's say they, let's say you have a, a goal of $1,000 a month and they've, the pledges are $500 a month so far, 50% of the goal. Then everybody gives 50% of their pledge, which means you have like 50% of, you know, half of, half of a 50% pledge. So you've got 25% of your goal that the project receiving. So that's why it curves up like this. Then if you do have a goal, you can ask, well, what are you gonna do when you meet, the, when you reach the goal? And in the, First, let's look at the example with the solid line. This is the, the lower one is a dotted line in case it's not visible from the back. But so one option is when you get to that, you just um, stop, you, 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 you stop matching, you stop coordinating, you just kind of continue from then on. So like if you're giving $5, you just keep giving $5. Um, in that case, the project receives a bit more as more people join the crowd, right? So, but it goes up in a straight line now rather than, this, rather than the curve. But this other option, which we uh, have called in the Snowdrift um, project, we've called share the burden, um, has some interesting advantages. So at this point, when you meet, reach the goal, everybody starts to give less as more people join the crowd. So there are a couple of advantages of that. One, one being that like, some, it matches some people's intuitions. 
that if you've got more people, everybody there should be less burden on everybody. Um, but it also introduces some stability in that it means like you can start to have a buffer where people can leave the crowd and the funding remains at the goal for quite you know with with quite a sort of lot of wiggle room. And you can see here what happens there for what the crowd for what the project receives is that they just receive the same thing from that point on, and each person's just having to give less and less to achieve that. Now another thing you could do is have a step function. So this this maybe has some simplicity in terms of explaining how it works. You could say, okay, we've got our big goal, but we're going to just make it simpler. Like nobody gives anything until we get quarter of the way there. And then everybody gives a quarter of their pledge. And then it stays the same until you get to 50%. You could do it however you like. You could have 10 steps, you could have two steps, whatever. It's really just an, a mathematically sort of simpler version of something like this, where you don't have to explain as much math to people. And then, then you have, um, you know, the, the ultimate in simplicity, at least, is just a threshold where you just say, nobody gives anything, you get to the goal, they give what they pledged. End of story. Well, not necessarily end of story, because then maybe you'll set, a, set a, your next goal. So then for pledge options, you can have it be a fixed thing. Like I mentioned with Snowdrift, it's a tenth of a cent per month per person. Or on one of the other ones, you could have it just be like $5 a month. Do you want to join us or not? Um, very simple. You could also op offer multiple options, like 5, 10, 20, 50. Um, or you could make it more flexible, but of course more, more complex in terms of the options the person's presented with, where there's, a, there's some, maybe some presets and an other box. Of course, I'm not, not depicted here. You, there's also an option to just have that box and like not have any options. Just say, tell us what you'd like to pledge and type it in. We're not suggesting anything. Then on top of this, another another question is, should there be any kind of maximum? Like, what what if somebody comes along here and they says, say, you know, like, I've I've got plenty of money. I'd like to contribute five hundred dollars a month to meet this goal. You might want to say, well, we want this to be a crowd of kind of peers supporting this project together. We don't want to have some somebody somebody come along and kind of just really dominate the situation. So there could be a, a rationale for putting a maximum on there like that. And you could either mention it up front or you could just not mention it like depicted here until they type something in and then they, you, know, you, could, you could have a little link that explains the reasoning behind it. So to, to summarize, um, we think that crowdfunding for open and abundant digital works, very much including software um, needs donor coordination and that's a critical missing ingredient that could make a really big difference if if implemented in an effective way um, the question is what's the most effective way or or maybe there are multiple ways to do it that should all be you know maybe, maybe some would fit one situation some would fit another situation um, but the key key variables are the coordination basis crowd size versus crowd pledge whether you have a goal, and if so, do you start with a small goal and then have a, a next goal and the next goal and the next goal? Or do you put your, your big sort of game-changing goal right up front? Um, how, do you, how do you manage the coordination in terms of function? Like, is it continuous um, or some sort of step function that's a bit simpler to explain maybe, um, or a threshold? What happens after the goal is met? And then do you give options for pledges? And if so, how many? And is there any maximum? Stuff like that. So thank you all very much for joining us. I think we open it up for questions now. And we've also got the, the, the next session is an opportunity for a more extended discussion of uh, all this and anything, you know, anything related to this track. Yeah. So. Thank you. I, I just I just like to to give a little bit of context and then open for questions. Um, in the discussion of snowdrift, the challenges of how to get this off the ground is something that again I'm not going to get into today. But uh, over time of working on this, the motivation comes from like each of us having our intuitions about this type of thing. Uh, I am in a crowd with a room with a bunch of people, and I have a wish to say 
what can I do where I can make a pledge that would motivate all of you to say like, oh yeah, I'm in, where it doesn't have to be, it's all worthless if we're not all together, if somebody's not sure, but like we can incrementally build the crowd. Because I want to say, look, I understand that somebody has to be the first person to pledge. Like, I'll do it. I'm the first to pledge. But I'm not sort of on the hook no matter what everybody else does. It's still contingent on everybody else working together. But it's also not, well, this is all totally pointless if like a few people are not up for it. You know, it's not a all or nothing question. And we can just apply this to actual projects you've been involved in or you can tell us about your intuitions. Um, and so our session at uh, three is... We're going to have a more interactive, actual, open thing with some uh, led by some facilitating uh, to actually deal into the depths of some of this. But I want to make sure that everybody here, hopefully, will come back at round three and join us for that. Uh, have, if you have questions about any of the framing and the the premise that we've set up, we want to make sure that we're clear on all of these things and any other comments and questions. Yeah. I'm just curious if you've thought in the same vein about kind of like matching, I feel like is a, a really common way to kind of incentivize. So it's like, you know, there'll be a three X match for this period of time. Uh, like is that? Yeah. So there's this, the whole point of this, and we, this is actually Michael's original term, but we've been using for years now is crowd matching as the term for this entire class of stuff where the point is, instead of there being a big donor saying, here I am a big donor and I shall donate this enormous amount. Instead, I will be transparent about this. I heard uh, someone in who deals with fundraising here at this conference talk about that as being a fiction in that it is almost always the case that the person who offers that is going to give all of it no matter what anybody does at the end of the day. And it's very hard to tell them, actually, we really need this to be sincere, uh, which to me undermines the the integrity of this whole thing. And so the crowd matching says... We want all of those dynamics, exactly that same matching focus. But it's everybody who's, everybody's but matching. I'm everybody matching else. everybody, every, right. There's not some one pot of money that we're matching and it's this, it's... Everybody's both the matcher and the small donor. So I guess like on top of that, have you found ways to kind of incentivize people acting or kind of, do you think about like time limits or like how do you... Because I feel like that's like what people are trying to do is like the psychological yeah. kind of effect of like, how do you get people to actually, to your point, kind of like start the process of donating? Yeah, we, ha we haven't thought about time limits. I don't think we've, we, we basically, we've always been thinking about ongoing funding. So not, not a sort of Kickstarter type thing where you're trying to reach a goal in a time limit. So from that point of view, it's kind of, I guess we, we maybe we have discussed a few years ago, the idea of like, having a sort of time limit for reaching a goal and saying like, okay, if the goal isn't reached by in a year from now or something where it's the project will get dropped or that kind of thing. We haven't talked about that in a while, but, um, but the general idea for getting people to join is trying to communicate the sense of empowerment and like, this is an opportunity to really make a difference together. And it's different from what the options you've been offered in the past for contributing? Well, the, the way that I would frame that same point, and this is how I've been saying it all along, but I, we're trying to open up the intuitions everybody else would offer with this, is basically if you're early adopter, then it's an extremely low amount. We want it to be, if you're matching a big crowd, then we're not asking for much because you could say, sure, in a couple of months, this is going to cost me pennies, whatever, sure. If you care, you, you, it's a very, very low burden as opposed to, are you willing to make this huge pledge to this Kickstarter right now? You know, and you're like, uh, I don't know. And maybe you're, that's a different calculus. And then if there's a bunch of people who are already there, you're saying, oh, uh, these 600 people are all going to give the project more money because they're all offering to match me. So my joining is getting more from the rest of the crowd as right. well as inviting more people. And in, in my experience, just even talking to people, uh, this one change, just being able to say, if you're early on, it's barely anything. And if you're later on, like you're increasing the donations from all the existing patrons is enough to basically get almost everybody to say sure, uh, yeah. at least initially, if they support the project. And on crowdmatch.org, we've actually got a, a sort of interactive simulator that shows specifically like this is how much the, how much the crowd is giving because you're, of your pledge. Mm -hmm. And it it shows you both at the whole sort of whole whole project level, the whole crowd level, but also as an individual, like basically a sort of sliding. Uh, yeah, if you were not in the crowd, 
this is what difference it would make to the project, and it's not just your money. Yeah. Because it's matched. And this also, depending on some of those variables we were talking about earlier, um, the match rate, like if everybody's giving the same amount, or if you're doing dollar goal matching, then it's a one-to-one -one match. So whatever you put in, the whole crowd collectively puts in that same amount. If it's a patron base, like how many people are giving, then different people giving different amounts means you might be matched slightly differently. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to say a thing I think is true, and then I'd like to tell me how you thought about the problem. Um, it seems like accountability is pushed out into the donor relationship, right? So uh, in particular, you have several sides that said, this will make a meaningful difference. This is mm. our first target. Did it make a meaningful difference? No. That's between the, the person who's getting funding and the donor. Right. That, that, that's how it seems like accountability is supposed to operate the model. How have you talked about things like, are, is the project delivering on what it said it's going to do with the Did, legacy and so on? Yeah. I, um, well, well, because it's ongoing funding, you, the project has the challenge both of attracting a crowd in the first place and keeping the crowd. So once, once they've got a crowd, let's say they've got several thousand people who are each donating a few dollars a month, um, those people can all join, leave at any time. And so if they don't communicate well with them what they're doing and how, what, how their support is making a difference. You know, some people might just not be paying attention and they'll keep donating for a long time anyway. But a lot, anybody who's paying attention is going to want to know, okay, how is this making a difference? So I would say, would you yeah. add anything to yeah, that? Yeah, the, the, just, just that I, I've often characterized the contrast with what we're trying to do and something like Kickstarter where there is this risk of if you gather all the money on all the funds all at once, all at front, then how do you have it accountable that it ends up being used well? And this is a framing that you might use for what we're talking about. This whole dynamic is about slow building. We're not trying to kickstart boom all at once. And we're not even proposing this as how to start your dream project that you've never even touched. And it's just a, a dream. We're proposing this as how to you know, sustain things and build over time. Yeah. And it certainly needs for this to work. You need to have an audience to start with. Like you, this isn't a way to, to get your project from nobody having heard about it. You, you need to have a lot of people who've heard about it and appreciate it to start with. Um, one one bit of language that I didn't see as much in here, but kind of addresses that is uh, we've talked a lot about this being a way to have like a democratic patronage model. Mm. Uh, patronage being one of the traditional economic models where if you're an artist, you have a you're a patron, like you are having to do the thing your patron said. Um, but now you have many patrons. And so by creating that like kind of democratic people can lead or join based on the things you're doing, that's uh, how the project then is accountable to their patrons. Yeah, and in many ways, um, thanks for mentioning that, Saul. I think it's very important. Um, it's, it's a way to, I mean, the basic idea is to give people, give large groups of people by having numbers numbers of people who are just have ordinary financial means, um, not super wealthy, give them power that's equivalent to the power that very wealthy people have as patrons. So yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd go back to my part of the talk and say, all of these are thoughts and proposals and things that about mechanisms of how do we achieve this goal. But the key thing is, what will make the incentives for the project be aligned with what's in the public interest. And so that's one of the reasons we would be hesitant about these things where do we want to allow some patron to come along and be, well, I'm going to give 50% of the entire goal because I'm rich, because that makes the project, their incentives are much more towards make sure that that donor is satisfied. Yeah. And we want the focus to be on what will be good for the general public. apply this model based on an existing set of people who care about it. Yeah. Um, how does that work for projects like like maybe the 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 valuation is you know not as uh, important as it should be. So for example, 
um, Inkscape versus KQ. So Inkscape is used by a certain set of people, uh, probably has a bigger user base. JQ, not that much, but they're used by them. Um, um, I, I've always thought of this as essentially the general public is interested in the things that they most close to. And so we think that the funding should be flowing upstream from the project. So I, the vision I have, and this is kind of a, it's not a direct answer, but the way I think of it, uh, I, I fund my public library, I fund my public parks, I mean, through, through taxes in this case, but these are the things that I directly interact with. And then there's a bunch of things of people who are experts who know about these other things that have to happen in the background in order for these things I use to, to happen. And I'm just hoping that if the, I'm funding the things that I'm directly appreciating and that the general public is appreciating, that that includes the projects supporting all of the things that they depend upon. So the things that are less popular or more niche or more, uh, you know, they have their own set of challenges. And maybe this type of model would work or would be tweaked to fit each of the different circumstances. But in a world where there are things like Inkscape that are super, super popular and are still struggling, we're trying to solve that dilemma. And we assume that if if we actually solve this and they can look at Inkscape and go like, this is totally what it works for Inkscape, then we can either, it'll be a totally different world already. But also uh, they could look at that and figure out, well, what does what does that look like adapted to this other more niche or more upstream situation? Yeah, and another thought that occurs to me about that is related to that idea of share the burden where you could have the project say what their goal is, but then if they're successful enough at attracting a crowd, that there are actually like twice as many people, you know, the, the, the willingness of the crowd that they can attract to donate is like double what they actually need. You could have a situation where instead of everybody giving less, the project gets to say to say what other projects they depend on that need funding and that basically say, okay, Sorry, um, we we want we want to redirect this our our crowd's willingness to the things that are maybe less well known, less popular, but that we couldn't do what we're doing without them, and so that that could go some way, I think, to addressing that issue. Maybe. <laughs> uh, the the real short answer is there is a scope of projects that fit this best that are already in need, and that's where we're pu putting our attention. And we're not saying it's a one-size-fits-all model for every right. every type of public good. Um, but at uh, at the next session, we will continue this discussion in, in depth if you can join us and we can actually have some smaller uh, continuing discussion of these things. Yeah, I'd like to thank our speakers and thank you all for being here. Thank you.